Hello, good morning, and welcome to uh, the Alation webinar for a data catalog um, and as it opens the door to open data in San Diego. My name is Satyan Sangani. I am one of the founders and the chief executive officer at Alation, and I'm excited to be joined by two uh, of my co-presenters, um, uh, most notably the chief data officer at the city of San Diego, Maxim Pachersky, and also our vice president of marketing, Stephanie McReynolds. Um, before we start the webinar, I wanted to um, make one note of a, of a pretty uh, 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 laudable prize that uh, was a, and uh, recognition that was received by the city of San Diego through Bloomberg. Uh, Bloomberg went through and evaluated which cities in the United States are the best at using data and using an evidence-based approach in their decision making. And you will uh, note from the slide that city of San Diego was marked as uh, one of the top 10 cities in using data. And, and that certification is something that I think it makes this webinar particularly notable because very aligned with uh, Alation's vision of empowering a curious and rational world, uh, part of that is aligning uh, to having curious and more rational cities and more rational public decisions. And so we're super excited to work with the city of San Diego to learn how to exactly do that. Um, before we start the webinar, I'm just gonna take care of a few housekeeping items. Uh, today's webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes uh, with about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. And so we encourage uh, you, the audience, to ask, ask any questions using the online uh, question interface. Um, there's a chat window to your right, and you'll notice there's a down arrow uh, bar to ask or post any questions that you might have. Uh, we encourage you absolutely to share thoughts. And so the two uh, things that you can do is uh, uh, reference at Alation, uh, which is, of course, a at sign A-L-A-T-I-O-N on Twitter, and also use the hashtag data catalog, all one word. You're, of course, welcome to use um, and reference anybody else that you might want to or any other hashtag that you might want to. Um, you can contact us at any point in time at alation uh, slash learn more, and there'll be links following the end of the presentation with other uh, materials that might be uh, relevant and useful in the context of this webinar. Um, do please share the replay with other folks. And I'll remind everybody that often on webinars, people are looking for product demonstrations. Um, in this case, we're really going to be talking about the use case and the case study uh, with regards to City of San Diego. And so that'll be the primary topic, but you can certainly follow up um, with relation to the extent that you'd like to be able to get a direct demo. However, there will be some screenshots for you to be able to see, which I think will really make the um, application come to life. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and start and introduce our two presenters. Um, and I'll do that uh, in reverse order. Maxim Pachersky is the uh, Chief Data Officer at the City of San Diego. Uh, Max has been, you know, really incredible both in his um, uh, forward-thinking uh, nature as uh, the Chief Data Officer of the City of San Diego, but also in his willingness to share many of the stories that they've built around data. And I think you'll see that today. And so I'm super excited to have you listen to one of the most progressive um, CDOs that I've been um, um, you know, able to work with. And for me, most excitingly, uh, you know, Max is in the public sector where you, where you, you know, wouldn't expect such revolutionary thinking. Um, Stephanie Rick Reynolds, our VP of Marketing, is um, somebody who has been in the data space for an extraordinarily long period of time uh, with companies like Business Objects and um, Trifacta. Uh, and Stephanie uh, is going to be joining us today to be able to set up a lot of the trends that sort of allow us to, to get to the point of using a data catalog in the public sector. So without any further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Stephanie, who's gonna to talk to us about how uh, we're moving towards open data and how that trend has, has evolved over the last five years. Thank you, Satyan, for the, for the introduction. Uh, if we can go to the, the next slide, please. I wanted to just set up a little bit of, of the background uh, of how the city of San Diego's use case might apply uh, more broadly. And uh, I'm sure as everyone on, on this call knows, um, there has been a tremendous increase in the amount of data that not only we're creating, but that we're storing on a, on a daily basis. Um, today, uh, every, today we create um, about 2.5 quintillion bytes of data, and that's actually estimated to double um, by 2020. Um, if we go to the next slide, you know, you can, you can question kind of how do we get here? Why are we creating so much data and how are we storing so much data? And I, I think that the, the answer is actually uh, quite simple. I can think about from 
um, a very personal individual point of view. I have a tablet, I have a cell phone, and I have an Apple Watch. And if I think about the sensors that are embedded in all three of those devices, um, and I think about my life 10 years ago, there has been a tremendous increase in the amount of data that I produce personally. Uh, multiply that by all the residents of the city, all the citizens of a, a state or a, a nation, um, and you quickly get to a good understanding of how um, data can have increased as, as much as it has uh, over the, the most recent past. Um, add to that all of the commercial sensors and IoT devices creating data, um, and I think that um, that figure of 2.5 quintillion bytes becomes uh, very reasonable very, very quickly with that, with that context. Um, paradoxically, however, this increase in the production of data has not magically led to an increase in the accessibility or the availability of that data. So if we go to the, the, the next slide, as Satyan mentioned, at Alation, we, we talk about creating a, a curious and rational world. And um, being able to do that by not only finding data, but understanding it and applying it to our, our decision making. Um, so I, you know, we, we, we tend to take a very, um, as a company, a very scientific approach to the world. And the idea that, that scientific research should be freely available for, for peer review um, and available to um, dig into the details um, in, the, in the scientific world um, was, was popularized um, just back in the, the 1940s. And it, it wasn't until the late 90s or early 2000s that the concept that government data should be freely available to citizens and across government departments, it really took into the late 90s or early 2000s um, for this to become a movement called the, the open data movement. Um, and so it, you know, we're, we're really still living uh, you know, in the, the early era of being able to uh, make avail data available and accessible um, to everyone and to approach um, decision making from a from a more scientific research oriented uh, perspective. Um, one of the you know one of the other challenges of open data is that while in uh, many countries uh, in Europe and the United States and Asia we've made a lot of progress in um, opening up data data globally for for research and data science in developing countries. Um, whether for reasons of convenience or cost or sometimes corruption, um, important decisions um, are not made on data. In fact, data collection is often not invested in. And so if you, if you look out um, globally, there are organizations um, that have been created like the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, um, organizations that have been created to fund the collection of data in developing countries. Um, so that open data can be a, a worldwide uh, movement. Um, so why, why pursue this? Why invest in open data, either from a, a city perspective like the city of San Diego or from a, a national government or international perspective? If we go to the next slide, there are some, and, and Maxim could speak uh, probably more elegantly to this than, than I can, but there's a variety of different um, reasons and advantages uh, uh, for using open data or opening up data to, to the public. Um, just like for corporations, um, data can be used to um, improve decision making in operations and solve issues more quickly. Um, of course, open data helps in establishing more efficient uh, government services for citizens. Um, but I think more interestingly is the type of citizen engagement that um, organizations find they get by opening up um, data, um, communicating to the, with the public um, through sharing um, numeric data and being able to track the success of, of policy uh, has been shown to lead to greater engagement with re residents and um, data-driven discussions. Um, Putting data online often saves residents time compared to uh, forcing folks to make a public, uh, a public records uh, act request um, and then waiting for a, a, a bureaucratic process to release that data. If you can uh, publish a good deal of data online, then it's freely accessible uh, and saves some time and, and cost for everyone involved. Um, and then I think most interestingly, as we'll see later in today's webinar, um, open data movements um, also help to enable government developers um, to create tools 
um, like streets.sandiego.gov um, that are applications that allow citizens to actually interact with data and with their government officials in, in real time. And that's true not just for government developers, but a variety of um, open data movements have led to um, volunteer resources being brought forth by the community um, to use um, data that, that often is published in a machine readable format for the purpose of opening that data to the public, but that then can be um, used by um, volunteer developers uh, to create new applications as well as um, used by those government developers. Um, so there's a, a, a lot of advantages on different fronts um, to improve um, engagement and uh, efficiency um, through open data movements that have led uh, many organizations to uh, adopt uh, and invest in um, technology as well as human resources uh, to support uh, open data. If we move to the, to the next slide, I think that one of the deeper questions uh, to look at uh, beyond opening data up to a wide community is making sure that along with um, that machine readable data set or a data set that's publicly accessible, are we also making sure that developers, um, whether they be volunteer in the government or citizens at large who may have access to the data, um, do they also have access to the context of how that data was collected? Um, you know, the quote here uh, mentions that data is only as good as how it's collected. And we have a tendency to think that if, we, in, at least in the United States, if we see numbers, they're accurate. Um, but numbers without context are very hard to interpret. Um, if you look at the image on the right hand side, those are, there are there are, are multiple ways of calculating how many individuals are in those two pictures. Um, and we can argue about um, the, con the conclusions, but it's important to, to understand how the data was actually uh, collected before you, you come to the conclusion and how to in interpret um, that, that particular uh, data set. And so if we go to the, to the next slide, what we've seen in working at Alation with many organizations is that seemingly small choices in how the data is collected or how the data is transformed or what the sample set is that you use can dramatically change the results of, of your analysis. And so transparency in how you get to result and how you collect the data and how you um, manage or transform that data to get to a point of analysis is that context is just as important to share as the raw data itself. Um, and so what we believe um, is in, important as we look at some of the use cases of how open data can be used with uh, Maxim in a few minutes is if we go to the, the next slide uh, to remember that it is easy to create um, what we would call stylized facts by not understanding the context. And so, um, you know, naturally different perspectives on um, business or, or, or government and the application of different analytic methods can result in dramatically different conclusions or insights. Um, you actually need to know the in, intent of the individual who's working with the data um, and their assumptions in order to be able to trust um, a conclusion um, that was data driven. And so um, systems like data catalogs can help share this context, um, can support this scientific approach to being able to have peer review of analysis and reproduce the logic that was used as each step, and then uh, really sustain uh, trust in data-driven de decisions by uh, publishing more, more uh, deeper descriptions of the methods that were used to analyze that data alongside of the conclusions or the, the facts that are being uh, presented. So I wanted to share that as a little bit of um, context on, on not just open data, but um, where we see some of the future investments um, in, in uh, government initiatives to open up data going in terms of sharing context, as well as access to the raw data. And uh, with that, if we go to the next slide, I'll turn over to Maxim to talk about um, a view from the, the field and um, how they were able to um, develop some systems and uh, processes with um, people processes to support this type of a, an approach to using data uh, and opening it up to citizens. 
Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, also, before I start talking, let me just apologize. I am in a co-working space today, so if there's any weird additional noises, um, that's, that's, that's what I'll attribute it to. Um, and so, as Stephanie said, I'm Max, and I'm the Chief Data Officer for the City of San Diego. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, I wasn't sure who was going to be on the webinar, and so I think it's kind of good to have an introduction of what it is that cities do, because before I started working there, you don't really know. Um, and so what we do as a city is we manage things in what is called um, the right of way, but we also manage businesses. Uh, we manage trash cans, we manage street lights, traffic lights, trees on the street. Um, we do permitting about where you can put antennas, about where you can open a business, what type of business you can open in what area. Um, so there's a lot of hidden things that um, a city administration does to make the city be a city in the way that it is. Um, can we go to the next slide? And then um, we also have data coming from things. So those same street lights and traffic lights are giving us data. We have a bunch of um, police cars, fire trucks, trash car, trash trucks, um, you know, all kinds of other vehicles um, giving us EVL information. Uh, we have various sensors in the street. So, so there's a lot of data that's coming back to us continuously. So that's data coming from things. Next slide. And so I run the data and analytics team for the city. And what we do is we really help residents and employees get and use data. And like that is a very, very broad description. And so if we go to the next slide, I will dive into what I mean when I say that. And so the way I think about having people get data is um, in order to be able to get it, you need to know that it exists, which means that you need to be able to discover it. Um, you also need to obviously be able to get it into your hands or on your computer or download it. Um, and that's where you have to actually acquire it. Um, so now you have it in your computer and you need to be able to understand it. You need to be able to understand what the columns mean, what are the caveats, how it's collected. Once you have that, you have to be able to ask an intelligent question, which is probably one of the hardest parts. Um, and then once you ask that question, you have to figure out how to get a correct answer and then use that answer to make a decision and sometimes automate the process, do it over and over and over again. Next slide. So most people think that we just do this all day. Um, I wish that, that would be great, but it's not what we do. Uh, next slide. Um, this is all the different types of data sources that we have at the city of San Diego. Um, so we have everything from files on shared drives, we have Oracle's databases, we have access databases on shared drives, we have two geospatial servers, we have Excel files, we have software as a service, and we have a bunch of sensors. And then there's a lot of Excel files that act as primary data sources as well. Next slide. So really, this is what we do all day. Kind of go crazy. Next slide. Um, and so my job initially um, in three and a half years ago got created with open data. Next slide. Um, and really with the open data policy. And the open data policy was a very broad document, but basically it said that we're going to we're going to do a data inventory for the city and understand what data the city has, and then we're going to release it to the public with certain timelines. Next slide. Next slide. Uh oh. 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 All right. Um, and so you know, so that is exactly um, that is exactly what I did. It took me about three months. I worked with 65 people across our 36 departments to try to understand what data does the city has. And it was what data does the city have, I'm sorry. And that turned out to be a very painful and difficult process um, because of the amount of people that we have and because of the amount of departments that we have and because of the amount of different data sources that we have. And so I knew I really didn't want to go through this again. Um, because I knew eventually I would have to. And so, so what I wanted to do is create a catalog that would be continuously updated and that would kind of act as that, you know, Wikipedia for data in the city. 
Um, and it would also allow us to have um, people that normally don't know how to install a SQL client be able to run a query. Um, it would also be allow us to have a common business glossary so we, we know what fields mean. Um, and really, at the end of the day, it was kind of allowing more people to use the data that we have rather than just having only the people that can run SQL or only the people that are quote unquote analysts can go and use this data. Next slide. And so with all that work, um, we eventually launched data at San Diego .gov, um, and it is our open source, open data portal, um, which is where we currently publish um, a lot of the city's open data. Uh, next slide. But really, what it is really designed to do is function as one source of truth. So we have all these different disparate data sources, and there's all kinds of ways that you can query them. Um, and the goal is that by the time that, um, oh no, sorry, looks like there's mic noise. Um, so by the time that it gets the data at San Diego.gov, um, we want it to be as accurate and as well documented as possible so that whatever things we build on top of it are really, really accurate. Next slide. And so um, streets, that San Diego.gov is a project that we did. Um, the mayor committed to paving um, a thousand miles of street and we wanted to show progress. And we also wanted to be able to have people track our work across the city for paving streets and be transparent both internally and externally. Next slide. Um, we won an award um, from the American Public Works Association. We were under the $5 million category and we were the only thing that wasn't a library or a bridge, so very exciting. Next slide. Um, and so it was a good story all around, except for when we were working with the people, um, you know, that owned the data. Um, they weren't very happy with us because we were asking them to continuously give us data. And next slide. And really, so we asked them to write down the process that it takes them to get data out and put it into this conflict mitigation system that we have. And what we ended up is with five pages of handwritten notes about exactly how to run the query and then all the manual steps you had to do in Excel um, once or twice a month, over and over and over again to get data into the system. Next slide. Um, we also had, so this is kind of the process, and we also had um, some discrepancies and some um, disagreements about what, very, what some of the various fields meant. Next slide. Um, and so what happens is you have a shifting source of truth because no human being can do manually 40 steps in Excel exactly correct the same way over and over again. Um, and then you have nuances hidden in people's heads because when they wrote down those steps, that was the first time those steps were written down. Um, and it's just time consuming. These people are not, you know, that's not their job. Their job is to pave streets. They're passionate. They're streets engineers. Um, this, this is no fun for them at all. Um, and so this, this is the type of stuff that makes people hate data and hate reporting. So we don't want that. Next slide. Um, and so what we were able to do is we were able to bring um, a dilation catalog and we put it on top of the pavement management system that we have. Um, we were able to scan and look through the queries and we were able to work with them to create a common set of documentation for what the different columns meant, um, what the different report, reports were, um, and how they were being used. Next slide. Um, and what that eventually led to is the birth of Tada Poseidon. His code names are really cool. Um, next slide. And what Poseidon really is, it's a data automation system. And it's a data automation system built on a project called Airflow, which was originally developed as an open source project by Airbnb. It is now run by the Apache Foundation. And what we really wanted to do is we wanted to be able to run certain sorts of tasks on a schedule dependent upon each other. Next slide. And so with Poseidon, we were able to take these 40 steps, you know, that would take, you know, about 10 or 20 hours each time you had to run them. Next slide. Um, and we were able to run it less than three seconds every night executed by a machine. And this is not the only thing we did this for. We did this for quite a bit of things. Next slide. And then, so we're running these things in a 
schedule, right? And the streets engineers are asking, hey, can you just let us know when the data set's updated? And I'm sitting there thinking, like, well, I can actually just send you an email. And that's exactly what we started to do. We started sending them an email every time the job run, we just added an extra task, and now they get an email every time the data set's updated. Next slide. And then we took it a little bit further and we actually thought, oh, we're already sending an email. What is it gonna hurt to put some extra metrics in just to help them see what they're doing? And so this is a prototype of a system that we've been playing around with um, where it's every time the job runs, it actually compares it to the previous month. Um, and it's telling them how they're doing since that, since that time frame. Next slide. And again, this all kind of goes back to wanting and needing and using the one source of truth. Next slide. And using that one source of truth, we were able to build things like performance at San Diego, which is the city of San Diego performance dashboard. Next slide. Um, yeah. Sorry, I think the internet might be stuck. Next slide. Oh, sorry. Um, Budget.sandiego.gov is another one that we were able to build. Next slide. And, and, and really, what we really want to do and what we think of when we come up with our projects is we really want to let machines do what they do best and we want to make make it so that humans can do what it is that they do best. We seem to be really good at keeping track of things, at being automated, at being running things, at running the same sets of tasks over and over again. Um, humans are good at creative work. Humans are good at asking the question. Humans are good at doing what a computer can. And that's really what we want them to do. Next slide. And so the way that we think about it is, if we take raw data that's well documented and you know properly understood with its caveats, um, we perform static analysis on it. Eventually, we take that static analysis and we make it dynamic so that analysis runs every day and generates a decision, or maybe runs every hour, maybe runs every minute. And that decision is actually implemented by a human being. So something that results in a service change. Um, I think we can get to we think we can get to same resources. Um, but better outcomes. Next slide. Um, another project that we did is to try to understand um, risk claims within the city so that uh, um, various teams within the city can go and prioritize um, what they fix better based on whether there's a high amount of risk for being sued. Next slide. Um, parking utilization, since we have, uh, we have a bunch of parking meters, parking meters have to be maintained. We don't want to maintain parking meters that don't make a lot of money. And so what we were able to do is we were able to find blocks where there are parking meters um, that are not generating a lot of revenue and hand that off to our department that handles parking uh, to potentially remove some of those meters and place them in other areas. Next slide. And this one I'm excited about. This we actually didn't build. I pulled it from a demo online. Um, like we didn't build the interface. Um, but what we did do is we we have a bunch of trucks that move from different facilities from one facility to another in the city. And what we did is we essentially reprioritized their routes and their stops so that they're traveling less and they're actually able to finish their shifts faster and do more things within their shift. But the interface one day, but not yet. Next slide. And so, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I get to tell you these cool stories, but really what, what we've really gotten to is um, our team is the one that gets a phone call now when somebody's looking for data and it's not an illusion. Um, we've been able to bring a lot of cost savings and time savings to the city. Um, and these are kind of things, the two metrics I think about a lot is um, we've been able to reduce the time to data. So I want some data, I have it in my hands. How long does that take? And then um, reduced the data to answer time. So I have the data and I have a question and I wanna ask a question and get an answer. Um, I think we've reduced that as well. Next slide. Uh, and I will hand it off now to Satyan. Uh, thank you, Maxim. Um, 
So for me, one of the most exciting um, you know, an, initiatives with uh, a data catalog is that it both allows the people who are supplying the data uh, to, to collaborate with the people that are consuming the data. So you know, it, it helps with both uh, data entry and data capture where lots of different people and lots of different processes are both uh, either integrating via application or manual data entry or through some batch process. Um, and I think what was exciting in, in Maxim's example was that uh, the catalog helped in, in capturing the data, but then um, you know, what's even more dizzying, of course, is how you could enable people to be even um, you know, uh, 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 building things like where, where you're not going to have um, uh, parking meters. And I know all of us, uh, you know, there's nobody on this call that loves parking tickets, but the notion that says that a city is being data-driven about where it's putting its meters and can turn that into a profitable enterprise based upon where people are actually parking is um, amazing for the city and obviously amazing for citizens. Um, and so we see that in that context. And of course, you know, what's interesting is that a lot of the participants that signed up for this webinar um, are, not, are not only in the public sector, but are in a wide variety of different industries. And I think, you know, for me, um, you know, as a founder of a company, one of the things that you find, uh, particularly with early stage technologies, when we were initially getting off the company off the ground, was that we, we actually couldn't find a, a specific industry where, where there wasn't interest. And so whether it's in software or retail or financial services or insurance or pharmaceuticals or telecom or payments or uh, you know, online or even uh, in, in uh, manufacturing uh, or in railways, I mean, there, there's so many different cases where uh, the data catalog has both helped people both coordinate around the capture and documentation of data um, and much more fundamentally enabled people to um, build amazing applications or answer really crazy, uh, incredible questions, which they would not have otherwise done were the, e the data not easy enough to access. Um, and so, so that, that curiosity uh, you know, led to actual a action where I think lots of people want to be able to use data they can't. Um, and, and I think these are all use cases where, where people have found that they can because the catalog makes the data, data much more accessible. Um, and so I think, you know, when, when I think about different, um, different use cases, I mean, I think the, the most obvious one is basic accessibility uh, for, for data catalogs. I think when, when you think about where people can, can get access to data, you know, the, the, the simplest thing is the findability. Can I discover the data? Can I find where it's located? Uh, can, I, can I, as a person that doesn't speak data, doesn't speak uh, Python, doesn't necessarily even speak SQL, uh, go locate a data set that I might need to use if I want to plunk it into Excel or something related to that. Um, you know, another, of course, is you know, second order benefit is, of course, governance, which is if you are the person that is supplying the data, if you are the person that is responsible for managing or curating the data, then being able to ensure that whether it's an app developer, a common citizen, or somebody who is generating an insight, uh, that that, you, that person is using the data appropriately, both from the perspective of compliance, but also from the perspective of uh, knowing how to use the information and having the appropriate context. Uh, and that's certainly a, a phenomenal um, uh, derivative use case. But I think ultimately what you want to do is you want to do the, you know, the third thing, which is drive data literacy. I think um, you know, whether it is running a city uh, so that you can optimize routes or place parking meters in the right places, or pave streets in the right ways, um, or it is to run a manufacturing facility or administer better health outcomes. Um, you want people to be able to use data to make decisions. And that process of teaching people to use data is really pe teaching people to think scientifically, but also giving them the context of how data was collected so that they can actually start a scientific inquiry. Most, most times in scientific research projects, is, is not really associated with the research or the number crunching. It's often with just collecting the initial data set and making sure that that collection is accurate. Um, and so being able to be data literate is in some sense, um, you know, uh, you know uh, synonymous with being able to understand uh, how to solve a problem. And the learning process, whether it's peer journals in academia, or in this case, um, a, a social catalog, allows for people to be curious in a communal way because that social process of learning what other people have done in the past and what data might exist in the past and how people have documented it in the past allows you to learn from what people have done in the past so you can then drive in the future new uh, insights and new uh, potential outcomes. Um, 
One interesting use case, though, that sort of arches across all three of these is this notion of infonomics. And, and I think this is certainly an emerging practice area and one that's very exciting for us, which is, you know, as we think about the, the notion of, of, of empowering the curious and rational world, um, you know, I, I, I sometimes say that with a smile because it is really, really, really difficult to quantify um, uh, that outcome. You know, it's, it's something that everybody believes in, but, it, but it's really hard to measure. And one of the things that we can see is as we watch how people are using the data through the catalog and as we observe the logs in the underlying data systems that the catalog sits on top of, one of the really exciting things is that we can start to measure um, how organizations are using data and the outcomes that people achieve through using the data. And, and there, in you can start saying, well, we can now understand the value of the information and the value of the investment in their information. And that's really exciting because it, it shows a real dollar ROI return on where people are making investments in data. And it shows something that is real, really practical as opposed to theoretical. I think, you know, certainly in business, data is the way to be able to move um, outcomes forward. But often what you find is that people can't, um, people can't really understand um, how, how that that line is developed and what the ROI might be for the business and use case. So with that in mind, um, I know we've got a whole bunch of questions. And so, um, you know, I will, I will go ahead and uh, take a few of them. Um, and so what I would encourage people to do is uh, use the question interface. Uh, again, there's a tab with a, with an arrow that would point to the right saying question. You can use that to ask any uh, questions uh, for, uh, to start. And the, First question, I'm going to go over to uh, hand over to Maxim, um, and he talked a little bit about this, but I think it'd be great to get one level of detail. Um, and so the question is uh, really one that I'm that I think is uh, one that uh, I, you know is near and dear to my heart, and so I'd love to hear the answer to it just as much as the person asking it. Um, it actually comes in from an individual from New Zealand, and he says, "How did you tackle uh, Maxim the cultural changes around data ownership and encourage the sharing of of their IP, their intellectual property?" Uh, we have um, actually implemented Alation, uh, and we are wanting to now get business engagement uh, to be able to create useful articles on, on data sets. So I'll, I'll pass that over to you, Maxim. So, um, so hmm, the intellectual property question is interesting. I'm not sure. So for us, at least in the U.S., we have, um, you know, everything's a public record. Um, everything the government creates is a public record. Um, we have pretty strong laws that, at least locally, that govern that. Um, and so what will happen a lot of times is you'll have, um, you'll have somebody that makes a public records request and says, hey, I want to see all of your 311 requests. And, you know, it goes to the rooting process and it goes to person one. Person one runs a query in their own SQL, comes back with a result, um, and, you know, that's the answer. A month later, that same person comes back, asks the same, asks the same public records act request, a different person now runs a query with a different answer, and then there's a new story about how the city doesn't know how to manage data. Um, and so open data helped to prevent a lot of that. Um, so we didn't really have a lot of conversations about intellectual property or property ownership. We kind of look at it as, you know, it's the city's data and it's the public's data. Um, but it was more around conversations around efficiency. It's like, hey, you guys have to run this report all the time. Let's just get it out there. Um, and so that made the conversations a lot easier because now you're not saying, hey, here's this extra thing that you have to do or here's this thing that's going to burn me. It's like, you guys are already getting this stuff out. Um, let's just make it smoother and easier. I hope that answers the. I hope that answers a little bit. Yeah, no, it sounds like you had the law on your side. I'll just ask one more question as a follow up to that individual. Um, with all of this data sort of being legally mandated to go out from each of the different departments, when people in the public were suggesting changes, did you see a lot of resistance um, from from the individual departments, and how did you tackle that culturally? When the public were were asking for changes. Or we're, we're finding insights that were not known that might have implied changes uh, to, to processes or, or outcomes. Oh, well, I think we've always kind of had this standing of, you know, we're not perfect. We're just like any other organization. Organizations make mistakes. And so, you know, if you have something to tell us, then tell us. We'll be happy to hear it. Um, and, and, you know, we'll... We'll look into it and see if that's something we can fix, or if there's, or if there's a, diff, a deeper problem, maybe some sort of policy, some sort of law that you know makes us do things that way that we do things. 
So I don't think we've run into I don't think we've run into any contentious analysis that somebody's done on open data that I've seen yet. And I mean it's been a while. Excellent. Yeah, I think we find that with a lot of our customers as well. I think a lot of this starts at the top where leadership um, has to encourage people to have a growth mindset uh, and, and learn from their mistakes as opposed to being penalized for them. And, and I think that is a, uh, a you know, top-down um, uh, tool that I think people have used uh, so that they won't get punished for, for their contributions. Another question a little bit more tactically. Um, uh, I'm on the data.sandiego.gov site and I don't see those graphs. Are they out there. So again, this is maximum. Oh, for you. I'm assuming I'm assuming you're either talking about streets at San Diego.gov or performance at San Diego.gov. So these are different. These are different URLs. Um, so I'm assuming you're you're thinking when you said graphs, you're thinking about streets, and it's just HTTP um, Is that's where the map and the graphs are? Okay. Uh, next question for you again, Maxim. Um, how did you how did you build the business case for the cost of the software? Um, yeah, that must have been a pretty difficult challenge in the context of public sector. Um, for so there's there's a there's a few pieces of software. Um, Alation um, kind of enables us to do our job. Um, so it was you know it was a very easy sell. If we need to understand what data we have. Um, it purely was actually an internal to our team use case. Um, we need to understand what data is in these databases. We need to understand what data we have. This is the tool that lets us do that. Um, that's our business case. It was very simple. Um, the rest of the software that we run um, is actually um, open source. And so we have a highly technical team and so our software costs very, very little to run on the most, for the most part. Um, all the automation, data at San Diego.gov, we, which is not a standard model of how cities have approached it. Um, there's vendors and they, they, they ask people, they ask cities to pay a lot of money for a website that hosts data. Um, we chose to go, you know, our own direction. And that's why really we have very, very little cost to the open data and data analytics program in general. Super helpful. Um, Stephanie, I know that we've got a couple of questions and I'll, I'll throw this one to, to you. Um, what what is generically the data discovery process, um, and, and can the product scan across the network looking for sources, or are sources explicitly defined to the product? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. There, you know, over the last couple of years, a variety of different vendors have taken different approaches to data discovery. So it's one of those terms that um, can mean a lot of different things um, with a lot of different technology solutions. With Alation, what we've really focused on is helping to discover the business metadata that may be embedded in queries or visualizations that um, analysts and users are creating on top of their data. So when we implement um, within an organization, uh, we do ask um, the team to register their data sources with Alation. That, that is not an automated process to uh, register sources on the, the network. Uh, but then the introspection of those sources in determining what, um, what are the data sets that are available, how have those data sets been queried in the past, and the, and the machine learning to determine what are the, the patterns of usage that then interprets uh, business meta metadata, all of that is automated in, um, by the Alation product. So the initial connection to sources is, is not an automagical discovery um, feature. Um, but this, this ability to enhance the inventory of all those data assets with rich context is absolutely um, an automated process. And then um, humans involved in working with that data can also add their perspective um, intellation through the, the user interface that we provide as an application. Excellent. Um, and I guess, Maxim, this is sort of dovetailing on that question. Um, how hard is it to get Alation set up, and, and there's a follow-on, but I'll just start with that. And and you know, you spoke a little bit about the number of sources that you had between um, SQL Server and the like. And so, you know, if if you want to speak to the discovery process for yourself, that might actually be also a good good way to elaborate on Stephanie's mm -hmm. response. So, um, so Alation doesn't cover everything that we have um, because we're a city and we have a lot of GIS. Um, and so that's that's 
kind of something I've bugged you guys about enough, I think. Um, but, you know, adding a source into relation, what I usually do is I call our DBA. Um, I get him to turn on uh, certain functionality that says, hey, um, you know, we have to turn on query logging. And after that, it's pretty easy addition to get into relation. Um, one other, one thing that I've been thinking about um, as we move towards the future, because, you know, at the end of the day, um, it's impractical, you know, even ask relation to support like Excel, right, or, you know, access databases as primary sources, or, you know, I mean, you know, sometimes for the people that we have in the audience that are city people, you know, you're going to laugh, but you know, it's true. Sometimes we have a primary source that's a Word document. Um, you know, and so sometimes we just can't, we just can't do that. And so as we move forward, what I really want to have happen is I would like to have um, more of a data warehousing um, strategy where we have one or two or maybe even three large databases um, and Alation is sitting on top of those. And the, the Alation that's exposed to the users within the city is sitting on top of the warehouses. The relation that we use for our internal trying to figure out what it means is getting connected to different data sources. Um, and that's kind of how I see this moving along because at the end of the day, the way that we use relation is people, right? We um, use it to enable people to do um, analysis ad hoc or to be able to update the metadata or to be able to get the metadata and that's our general city user population. And we also use it as a um, data management tool internally for our team, which is much more technical and more detailed. Um, and so putting centralizing data in a warehouse and allowing city users to have access to that relation, I think would be would be a really good win for us. Got it. And and logistically, how long when you initially set up Alation did it take you to do? Uh, what was that in the days, weeks, months, years? Um, I, that was another follow-on question that came up. What, so how long did it take us to set it up? Yep. Um, does that include procurement or not? Because procurement is probably the longest part. I think it took like three or four months. But that's just because we're a city and procurement is hard. Um, once we actually got the go-ahead, I think, um, um, I think Collisions team set it up in a day or two, and then uh, it took me about three days or two days to get it into get Cartograph, which is a uh, street paving management system that we use, um, and figure out what the queries that we're running are, because I was just I was just able to scan the query logs really quickly. Um. The next question is, um, is there, uh, so this one's related to sort of sensitive data and also GDPR. And Stephanie, I'll turn this to you because um, I'm not sure how familiar, I, but you might be, Maxim, you are with GDPR, but uh, uh, are there any GDPR capabilities? Um, will it expose sensitive data to the catalog viewer? And uh, does it help identify relevant data for monitoring and reporting? Uh, and for those on the audience, I'm not familiar with GDPR is a set of regulations around data privacy originating in Europe. And as, as fo folks are familiar with um, the GDPR regulation um, by the, the EU, um, and, the, and the deadline is quickly approaching, so there's various states of, of folks that are um, taking a look at this, you'll know it's a, it's a very extensive regulation um, that um, enables consumers to have a, a more control over their data and requests that their data actually re be removed from uh, corporate corporate systems. Um, Alation provides uh, capabilities to assist with um, GDPR. Um, I, I wouldn't position G uh, Alation as the only GDPR uh, solution that you'll need to uh, meet the requirements, but what Alation's particular strength is, is in um, connecting to the source systems and being able to um, tag and track personally identifiable information through all the analytic workflows that might be run with that, that data. Uh, so in order to uh, be able to comply with the request, if a, if a 
a consumer request to be forgotten by the company and their data removed from the all of the databases or, or file structures or algorithms or reports where that data sits. Alation can assist with finding all of those places the data would need to be removed from and to do that in a, in a fairly automated uh, way. And so um, that in particular is um, the fit for Alation in meeting that regulation. And we have um, a variety of, of customers, uh, both in Europe and the United States, uh, who have been using Alation already as part of their GDPR initiatives as we come up on the, the May deadline for um, compliance with many of those organizations. And Stephanie, a follow-on question there. Does Alation expose sensitive data to any catalog viewer? Oh, right. Sorry, I forgot that part of the question. Um, so we do, we do, we do not expose sensitive data to um, catalog viewers. So we have the ability to um, label and then mask sensitive data so that someone who wants to um, find what data is in it available can get an indicator that there might be uh, data available in an area, but cannot access all of the underlying um, sensitive records if um, they don't are not authorized to do that. And for um, general security in the Alation Data Catalog, we, we mirror the security um, that is set up in your database systems or your file structure systems or your BI systems um, that you have running. And so um, we can put an additional level of um, masking on, on top of that. But as a starting point, we're certainly reflecting the access uh, patterns that you've already defined in the source systems for that data. Great. Uh, Maxim, back to you. This question is um, more with regards to how relation is used between the public and um, uh, sort of employee base of, 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 of the city of San Diego. Is there a common portal that provides access to the data, Alation data catalog along with solutions like Poseidon? Um, no. Um, maybe one day, but not yet. So um, Pose both Poseidon and Alation. So Poseidon is um, is um, a Flask application that runs on a Unix server with in our firewall because it needs access to databases on our network. Um, so that's very well hidden. I mean, that's behind the firewall and there's no reason for it to be accessible outside of the firewall, either by the public or by really by any of my team. Um, Alation is also the same thing. It's running on a Unix, on a Linux server. Um, same thing within the firewall, um, and it is accessible to people that are within the firewall, so people that are on the network, um, but not available to the public yet. Um, we have talked about potentially making a public-facing Alation portal, um, and you know we, we've had several conversations about it, um, and that is that's something that we've thought about and are considering, and maybe one day it'll happen. Um, but there's no there's no direct plans to do that just yet. Um, not, not because we, we don't want to, or because we, we don't have bandwidth. <laughs> yeah, and, and you mentioned you had a relatively small team internally, therefore using Alation to build all the external facing data applications. Can you give a sense to the audience of, of how many folks are using it? Um, so currently, so, to do to do all the things that you've done, uh, yeah, to just give the audience a sense for how many folks are are using it. So my team is um, two people besides me. Um, sometimes it expands to you know four or five. It depends how nicely I ask. Uh, we work really closely with IT though, um, and then we have um, people in our street paving division and also people in our um, water monitoring division that currently use Alation. And so how have you been able to kind of get all of this data documented with such a small team of people? Um, you know, how, uh, what, what, how is that? Um, so need, um, really when we were doing the streets extraction, it was mainly just going, we were basically using it like a Google Doc with the street paving team and saying, hey, um, our team go in, write some initial documentation, send it over to them. Like, hey, is this right? They were going to make a few changes, um, send it back to us. So it was a very collaborative process in that manner. Um, and now it's just need because they're going in and they're writing SQL queries for the reports that they have to run, um, or we have some that we've helped them make. And so um, 
you know, it's kind of useful to them to keep it updated. And the LIMS people, the LIMS, LIMS people are the, um, um, the water monitoring people. Um, they're a little bit less active there. Um, I'm hoping that eventually they'll start getting a little bit more active in relation. They're also replacing their limb system. And for those listeners that are in a, that are in government system replacement is always hard and a big thing. Um, but I, it, I, the way that I see it, it's the same way. It's going to be always driven by need. If I have to run this report or if I have to run this analysis, if I have to run this SQL query and I keep forgetting what this field means, I'm just going to go in and write it down because relation is the best place to write it down. Um, not a spreadsheet, not a piece of paper on my desk. Um, it's just there along with my query. And so the way that I see it, it's, it's always going to be drawn by need. Got it. And so in, in that scenario, uh, all of the folks that would be using Alation, therefore, are, you know, uh, somebody's asking a licensing question would be a sort of a contributor role. And then all of the folks that are sort of outside of uh, it and maybe the street behaving team could have been a collaborator uh, role. Um, uh, for the product, uh, one other question came up with regards to uh, APIs. Did your does your team use the APIs to extend or integrate any of the applications that you have? Uh, um, Annihilation, yes, we have used it once or twice. We'll probably use it a little more. Um, there's that open source R connector written by somebody at eBay. Um, R Alation to R API, or Alation API to R. Sorry. Um, and we've used that for some analysis we've done on streets data. It's been really nice. Um, but I would, I mean, I'd like to use it more. Okay. Um, and somebody literally just asked uh, as the very last question, which is quite apropos, uh, will the session be available as a recorded video that we can watch later? And Stephanie, I'll hand that softball over to you. <laughs> yeah, that's an easy one. So uh, we definitely are recording all of today's uh, webinar, and um, within 48 hours, we'll be sending out the links uh, to participants. And if you have any colleagues who would like to uh, see a copy, you can also share the link with, with them and um, or register on our on our site, and we'll make sure that um, anyone who registers even after the webinar will get a, a copy of the material from today. Um, and uh, Avez, who, who, who's, uh, quite, uh, who's quite enthusiastic about his capabilities, said 24 hours. So he was, he was optimistically. Uh, oh, I didn't part. want to put him on the spot. I, <laughs> I said 48, <laughs> so 24 to 48 hours. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Maxim. Um, it's been a fun conversation for me, and I appreciate uh, everybody in the audience taking the time. Um, and uh, please follow up with us um, in the following ways. Um, uh, if you would like to be able to um, come and see, read more about data catalogs, uh, I would recommend looking at a Gartner paper called Data Catalogs of the New Black in Data Management and Analytics. Um, you know, it'll talk a lot about the use cases and what people are doing with the data catalogs, and that's alation.com backslash new black. Um, and then if you'd like a demo of the product that's more personalized, uh, again, you can go to alation.com slash get demo uh, 218. And so, the, again, that's Capital G E T, capital D E M O, um, uh, 2000, uh, or sorry, 18, um, and that's not necessarily case sensitive. Um, and so, uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close. And I appreciate all of your time, and have a wonderful uh, day and the rest of the week.